Today on Know the Truth, Philip DeCourcy introduces the quest for the best. The bird was made to fly, the fish was made to swim, and we were made for God. All things were created by Him and for Him. And when you and I try to do without Him, life is a dead end. It's an empty, ignomatic experience. The gifts of life severed from the giver of life will never satisfy. Everyone's on a quest to live their best life, but whether you're seeking money, goods, or pleasure, those things can never bring lasting satisfaction. Welcome to Know the Truth with Philip DeCourcy. Today, Pastor Philip explores the true purpose of life with a study in Ecclesiastes titled Quest for the Best. We'll be gaining spiritual insights on how to lead a rich and joyful life through a profound reverence for God. You can listen online at ktt.org. Here's Pastor Philip with his opening message titled The Road to Nowhere. Recently, I read a story from from Irish history, and it caught my uh, attention. Times were hard, unemployment was high, and so to counter the problem, the Irish government embarked on an ambitious road-building scheme. Many new jobs were created. Many whistled while they worked because they were thankful for the dignity of work. They were grateful for the opportunity to put bread on the table. But after a while, the motivation took a nosedive. And the reason was that the workers discovered that many of the roads that they were working on led to nowhere. Therefore, the work had no purpose. It was simply there to provide badly needed jobs. As I think about that, as you reflect on that, does that story not describe people in this world without God, without hope, They're like these workers. They're on a road to nowhere. Their life doesn't seem to have purpose or profit. And when they're honest with themselves, despite their health, despite their wealth, despite their freedom, despite all the things that they enjoy and experience, their lives are plagued with a sense of futility, a sense of meaninglessness. Despite multiplied blessings, Something doesn't add up. And you and I are nagged by the thought that whatever we have or wherever we are, there's something more. There's something more to life than the life we have. There's an emptiness. There's a meaninglessness. There's a futility. I was reading just recently of an interview that um, Chris Everett Lloyd did for an entertainment magazine. Remember Chris Everett? the darling of American tennis. At the height of her success, at the top of her game, she she talked about the fact that her husband, John, and her would go to the movies. They would eat good food. They would come home and watch TV. But she would often say, John, John, there's got to be something more. There's a big piece missing in the puzzle. She's not the only one to feel it. She's not the only one to express it. Media mogul, billionaire, Ted Turner, described life as being like a B-grade movie. You don't want to leave in the middle of it, but neither do you want to see it again. Peter DeFries, renowned American editor and novelist, stated, if you want my final opinion on the mystery of life and all that, I can give it in a nutshell. The universe is a safe to which there is a combination, but the combination is locked inside the safe. The American poet Carl Sandburg said, life is like an onion. You peel it off a layer at a time, and sometimes you cry. Given that raw reality, That makes our study of the book of Ecclesiastes so timely and so relevant. Because this book, among the canon of Scripture, adeptly addresses the fleeting and frustrating nature of life. 
We sense what Solomon addresses here. It's all vanity. Doesn't it seem all so pointless and purposeless? When you add it all up, it's not much. When you add it up, something's still missing. This book addresses that. It meets head on the general neurosis of our time. Emptiness, weightlessness, meaninglessness, vanity of vanities. That's what life sometimes seems. And that's what Solomon addresses here. Chapter 1 and verse 2, he says that. Chapter 12, verse 8, he says that the book is bracketed by this thought. What's the point and what's the profit to life? It can seem at times there is no point. And there is no prophet. The book of Ecclesiastes speaks directly to our generation that has more things to live with, fewer things to live for. We have more and more, but we seem to enjoy less and less. Why is that? Well, the book of Ecclesiastes will help us get a grip on that. The book of Ecclesiastes speaks directly to our day, a day in which life has been lengthened but it hasn't been deepened. And so we want to study this book because it's got something to say to us. It's a book marked by reality, okay? It will meet you where you are. It'll meet you on a Monday morning when you got the blues. It's a real book that addresses the real issues of life more than any other book in the Bible. Herman Melville, the author of Moby Dick, said, it's the truest book of all. It addresses the issue of the drudgery of work, the injustice of government, the dissatisfaction of foolish pleasure, the mind-numbing tedium of every day, the treadmill of, of existence. The book of Ecclesiastes is a book marked by reality, and that's why it's a book marked by relevancy. Leland Riken says of this book, it is the most contemporary book in the Bible. Ecclesiastes is a satiric attack on the consumeristic, hedonistic, materialistic society. It exposes the mad quest to find satisfaction in knowledge and wealth and pleasure and work and fame and sex. Solomon pursued all of those things. He abandoned himself to the pursuit of purpose in pleasure, to the pursuit of purpose in knowledge, to the pursuit of purpose in the acquisition of land and goods and stuff. He went down that road, and he's come back to tell us it's a road to nowhere. It's a dead end. And that's what makes this book so real and so relevant. It's a book marked by reality. It's a book marked by relevancy, and it's a book marked by redemption. A lot of times it seems very pessimistic. It's been called the black sheep of the Old Testament. It's been called the joker in the pack of the Old Testament. I want you to understand there is a message of optimism in this book. There's a kind of bait and switch that goes on in the book of Ecclesiastes. Solomon looks at life under the sun. It's a phrase you'll find many, many times in the book, and it's used purposefully. It's like he pulls a curtain around this life. Imagine, as John Lennon said, there is no God, there is no heaven, there is no hell. Let's just look at life below the horizon of the sun. What's it like? Well, for the fleeting pleasures that you and I might enjoy once in a while, it's a terrible thing. It's short, it's ugly, it's cruel, there's injustice, some have more than others, so on and so forth. But Solomon speaks that way, and then there'll come this bait and switch where he'll introduce God into the conversation, where he'll speak about enjoying life, enjoying the good things of God. He'll speak about fearing God. That's one of the great themes of this book because it's a wisdom book. And the aim of the book then is to show the hollowness and futility of life apart from God. That's the aim of the book. In fact, the key to this book hangs on the back door. Go to chapter 12 and verse 13. Chapter 12 and verse 13. Let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Okay, Solomon has set himself this task of searching whether there's any profit to a man toiling under the sun. What's the meaning to life in a mean world? Now, he, he looks at pleasure. He looks at knowledge. He looks at, 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 at sex. He looks at, uh, at so many aspects of life that so many people think 
You know what? That's the measure of success, and that's, that's the, the door to pleasure and satisfaction. And Solomon says, hey, I've, got, I've come to this conclusion. The whole matter, fear God, keep his commandments, for this is man's all. And I would put in parenthesis, and in this man finds his all. You cannot come to a proper understanding of the meaning of life apart from the author of life. And so Solomon is cruel to be kind. Solomon has his look at life under the sun, apart from God, so you get sick of it. And you understand that there's no lasting joy apart from the God who resides above the sun, who at a future time would come under the sun through the gift of his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. That's the aim of the book. It's to show us the futility of living life apart from God. And it's to promote the wisdom of knowing God early. This is a book written to young people. This is a book written, as we'll see in a few minutes, to the emerging leaders of Israel. This is a book that towards the end again in chapter 12, verse 1, will say, Remember now the Creator in the days of your youth. Don't think about a toddler or a four-year-old or a five-year-old. Think about young men and young women, young adults who are about to take to the road of life, who are full of life and they want a full life. And so they're asking themselves, which path is the best? Is it found in knowledge? Is it found in relationships? Is it found in the accumulation of wealth? Is it found in, you know, this philosophy or that teaching? And Solomon addresses himself to those young people. And he says that life under the sun apart from life above the sun, earth apart from heaven, time apart from eternity, and man apart from God is an empty thing. An enigmatic thing. It'll leave you scratching your head. It'll leave your heart empty. In the grand scheme of things, life apart from God all amounts to a soap bubble that pops. It's all vanity. 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 Solomon is the right person to tell us that. Solomon had all the wealth that a man would want and he had all that wealth could buy. He had all that wisdom could devise. He had all that fame could bring. And he had it all in abundance. But he says, you know what? I drank from the cup of pleasure. And I'm still thirsty. And I sat at the banqueting hall of fame and fortune. And I'm still hungry. It's all vanity. It's all vexation. Solomon learned the hard way, and he wants us to learn at his expense that the gifts of life severed from the giver of life will never satisfy. The bird was made to fly. The fish was made to swim. And we sang it. We were made for God. All things were created by him and for him. And when you and I try to do without him, Life is a train wreck. It's a dead end. It's an empty, ignomatic experience. That's what Solomon wants to get across. God has put eternity in our hearts. Ecclesiastes 3 verse 11. At his core, man is a spiritual being. And he must connect with the transcendent. He must have a relationship with the God who created him if he's going to live a life of purpose and profit. That's the message. That's the abiding voice. Apart from that emptiness, Ted Turner, to quote him again, said, success is an empty bag, but you have to get there to know it. And Solomon knows it because he got there. He lived on top of the world. The wisest, wealthiest man in his day. He'll tell us in chapter 2 that what his eye saw and what his heart desired, he, he took he got. But he says, hey, it's all vanity apart from God. When you divorce life under the sun from life above the sun, when it's time apart from eternity, when it's man apart from God, when it's earth apart from heaven, it's a disaster. That's the abiding value of this book. God must be given his central and commanding place in life for all the pieces to come together. Fear God, that's the point. The theme of fearing God, reverencing God, giving God his place, recognizing the weightiness 
of his nature, the eternity of his history, the awesomeness of his power, the glory of his purposes. Unless you grasp that and you live in the light of that, there will be a missing dimension to your life. It is that which adds weight to our feather light existence. Fear God. Understand who he is. Understand who you are in relationship to him. Understand the purpose of life. It is to glorify God. And John Piper is right. I commend his writings to you. God is most greatly glorified in us when we are most deeply satisfied in him because we were created for his glory. The Westminster Confession is right. The chief end of man is to fear God and to enjoy him forever. God wants us to enjoy life. But you can't depart from him. You can't separate the gifts from the giver. Time from eternity, earth from heaven, man from God can't be done any more than you can perch a fish on a tree or push a bird under the ocean wave. Those birds and those fish are out of their environment. And when you and I are living a life apart from God, we're out of our environment, our natural place in life. And this book gets that across. This book is God-centered. I know it doesn't seem that way at first reading, but God is mentioned over 40 times in the book of Ecclesiastes. This book is pessimistic about man, optimistic about God. And that's Solomon's point. He, uh, he feeds us salt to make us thirsty. He looks at life under the sun and shows how it's fleeting and frustrating. It's never what you want it to be. It's always, it's always short of something. Because you see, we have sinned and fallen short of His glory. And life always feels like there's something more. That's the, f that, that's the consequence of the fall. And you and I need to find a relationship with God again through Jesus Christ. God is the path to life. God is the road to happiness. Psalm 16 verse 11 tells us that, doesn't it? He will show us the path to life and in his presence are, and at his right hand are pleasures forevermore. Revelation 4 verse 11, he created all things for his pleasure. Eric Little, the runner in chariots of fire, because he keeps the Sabbath, he didn't run in the Olympic Games on a Sunday, but he he was put into another race during the week. There's that famous line. You find him running. He's panting for breath, but there's a smile on his face. And he tells his sister who thinks he should be a missionary. He says, you know what? When I run, I feel his pleasure. God wants us to feel his pleasure. He wants us to enjoy life. He wants us to help us understand his purpose in all the injustices and inequities of life. Solomon will help us get a grip on that. And it all starts with fearing God. That's what Proverbs tells, doesn't it? The beginning of wisdom is what? To fear God. So the book of Ecclesiastes is going to teach us. I like the story of the, the old guy who had his Model T Ford locked away in the garage for some years. Decided to bring it out one day. Got it to sputter to a start and went down the road. But after a while, it just, um, it died on him. And there he sat at the side of the road, stranded. Wasn't particularly mechanical. He really didn't know what to do. And presently, a wealthy man in a gleaming new Lincoln pulled up beside him and asked if he could help. The man said, I'd appreciate that. And so the stranger uncovered the engine compartment. He quickly made an adjustment to the old carburetor. He set the spark lever on the steering column to the exact position. Then he cranked that thing back into life. As he was about to leave, the amazed and grateful owner said, Sir, I'd like to thank you, but I'd like to know who I am to thank. And that gentleman turned around and said, My name is Henry Ford. <laughs> Henry Ford? the maker of the Model T Ford. No wonder he could fix it. There's a parable there, isn't there? We were made for him. We were made by him. And it's all vanity apart from him. But he can fix it. He can fix you. He can fix me. That's the message that comes from this book. That's the thesis. The godly life 
is the good life. Young people, write that down and start to believe it. Don't let this culture pull the wool over your eyes. Don't let the devil lie to you like he lied to Eve, that there's some greater good outside of God. There's no greater good outside of God. The godly life is the good life. Fear God and keep his commandments, for in this man finds his all. Live for the purpose for which God created you. Run and feel his pleasure. That's the message of Ecclesiastes. But you and I are going to be in this book for a while. And we need to understand its background. And it's important that we establish the fact, as I believe, that Solomon wrote the book because then his life becomes the backdrop to every passage you read. And it makes it live. This guy did all that he is writing about. There's a certain authority and authenticity to this just by matter of the fact that Solomon wrote it. And I think you've got a man here who's looking back on life. This is a man in the twilight years of his days. You know, when you're young, you've got all sorts of questions, but no answers. When you're older, you've got all sorts of answers, but nobody wants to ask you any questions. It's pretty frustrating, isn't it? You've got so much wisdom you want to pass on, but nobody's talking to you. Well, Solomon's old, and he decides he's not going to miss the opportunity to address the young men of Israel. And so he addresses them, and he wants them to learn on the cheap what cost him an awful lot, that it's all vanity apart from the God above the sun. You're listening to Know the Truth with Philip DeCourcy and the introduction of a study in the book of Ecclesiastes titled Quest for the Best. Today's opening message addresses the road to nowhere, and you can replay this message at ktt.org. Well, at Know the Truth, our passion is to share the gospel with a world in need of truth, but we couldn't do it without our listeners. It's your gifts that keep Know the Truth on air. And when you give any amount today, we'll say thanks by sending you Courage, Fighting Fear with Fear a book that offers biblical perspective on overcoming fear in all its forms. And today is the last day this book is available, so don't delay. Request your copy along with your donation by calling 888-644-8811 or visit ktt.org. Now, equipping godly leaders is also our passion at Know the Truth. And Philip, your annual leadership conference is coming up soon. Yes, this is going to be our 8th Annual and Trust Conference. Can you believe it? coming up on November the 16th. The event is geared for men and church leadership. And while all our topics throughout the years have been vitally important, I think this one is especially important. It addresses an historic moment and a serious issue in our times. We're going to be talking about the war on men and the need to build biblical masculinity within the church. There's a lot of talk in the media these days about masculinity being toxic, how we as a society need to push back against the patriarchy, and so on. But during this conference, I want to really challenge those ideas and encourage men to embrace godly masculinity informed by a biblical worldview. While society aims to pacify boys and emasculate men and even feminize the church, God intends to build up men in Christ for his kingdom. Men who will lead the charge in the cause for righteousness. So mark your calendar, Thursday, November the 16th, for the Interest 2023 War on Men Conference. You can attend in person at Kindred Community Church in Anaheim Hills, California, or online via live stream. Hope to see you then. And let me add that you can register and invite others at EntrustConference.org. I'm your host, Wayne Shepherd, inviting you back tomorrow for another message in our Quest for the Best series. That's Wednesday on Know the Truth. Today's program was produced and sponsored by Know the Truth Incorporated. Jesus said, you shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free.